So today, I'm going to set the bar low in terms of expectations. Joe always says that's key to giving a good keynote. Um, I'm not a data scientist. You may be happy to hear that or not. Um, I'm not, uh, not a specialist in data science. I'm a marketing person, a content marketing person, just like you. But my time at Cisco afforded me a very unique opportunity to work with some of the best data scientists um, out there at the moment. And I really wanted to come and share that experience and that learning with you all today and us as a community. Because I fundamentally believe, based on my experiences, that data scientists are going to be key and are key today in terms of how we plan, create, and measure our content that we produce. So, the first data scientist I ever met was a gentleman called Florian Zettelmeier. I'm terrible with names, but it's a really memorable name. He's an amazing guy um, from Kellogg School of Management. Spent some time with the Cisco leadership team, and I was very fortunate to study under him um, during this course. He was a very fascinating character. He opened basically saying that many of his colleagues in data science wouldn't bother talking to a marketing community, which I thought was a very bold statement considering the company he was in at the time. But he, he, he took pity on us. He felt sorry for us, and he felt that we deserved an opportunity, an opportunity to understand what data scientists do. He then continued, interestingly, opening with a movie, a reference to a movie called Moneyball. How many of you have seen the movie Moneyball? This is excellent news. I hadn't actually seen Moneyball when he first talked about this. So for those of you that haven't seen it, it's a story about, played by Brad Pitt, about Billy Bean and the Oakland A's. And I won't ruin the story for those who haven't seen it. But it's basically looking at the underdog and how you can compete and how Billy Bean competed using maths, math and statistics to really figure out the best way to choose players. But that wasn't the moment that inspired me to come and talk to you today. The moment was almost like a, a throwaway comment that Florian made at some point during the, the course. He talked about a new era, a new generation of companies that are data-driven. And he talked about a company that if you walk into the room and you say, I think this is a good idea, you're asked to leave the room. You're asked to leave the room if you say, I think this is a good campaign. I'll just let that sink in for a little moment. Because in a data-driven organization, you don't walk in and you say, I think this is a good idea. You say, I know this is a good idea because I have done the probability, I've done the math, I've done the statistics. Now, this information shook me to my core. It left me with a really deeply uncomfortable feeling in my stomach. And as I reflected on this, I wondered why. Why did this have such an impact on me? Because I pictured a really vivid picture of me being in that situation. What could possibly be more humiliating than to stand in a room with your colleagues and be asked to leave the room. It's a basic, fundamental, psychological need to feel respected. That's why it shook me to the core. But as I contemplated being in this position, I suddenly realized what had motivated my, my entire B2B marketing career had been about proving the value of marketing. From my very first day, my very first job, I've dug this picture out for you. You can all have a good laugh at that one. Fresh-faced graduate. I was keen. I was told that marketing was the heart of the organization. I'd spent four years studying marketing. I had postgraduate diplomas from the Institute of Direct Marketing, the Chartered Institute of Marketing. I was ready to bestow my knowledge on the world. So as I sat in this actual very crumpled red jacket, pulled from a pile of laundry, borrowed from my fellow students. I sat at my desk, ready to take on the world. I thought, maybe I'll start with Porter's 540s, a SWOT analysis. Let's generate some strategic options of where we're going to go. My first job on my first day, 
design an exhibition stand. You're laughing. Maybe some of you have been in this. We didn't cover design. I was not qualified as a designer in any way, shape, or form at this point. But with debts up to my eyeballs, as most students are, I thought I'll have a go and uh, have a go at designing an exhibition stand. But on that day, what was bequeathed to me, as many B2B marketeers have been bequeathed, is the concept of being part of the coloring in department. But I pulled myself up. I thought, that's OK. This is a means to an end. I need to gain their trust. I'll have a go. Turned out my exhibition stand planning skills weren't actually too shabby. Yay. So more and more exhibitions happened, more trade shows, more preparation. But I always had sights of why we were doing this. We were doing this to generate leads. We were to do, doing this to generate leads for the company. So as we, as we progressed, so many trees were killed in those days, so many trees. Brochures, staple, collate, staple, collate, night after night, preparing for these 12-hour trade shows. I learned some interesting things along the way. As a lady, if you're going to do a 12-hour trade show, heels or flats, combination of the both if you're interested, if your feet aren't going to fall off at the end of the day. Some slightly more commercially useful uh, lessons were learned. Stand briefings, carrot, stick, carrot, stick. Salespeople, fill out your stand forms. If you want to be here next year, you need to fill out your stand form. Fill out those leads. We didn't quite have an end-to-end -end content attribution model back then. Customer objection handling. Pushing that product straight into the mouths of those hungry prospects. So there's some good lessons learned. But as I progressed and the events became larger and my aspirations to prove the value of marketing became grander, I realized I needed to secure a budget. And yet again, another, another module that wasn't covered in my degree, how to tin cup budget from those in favor, those execs that we love to throw stones at so much those execs that are interested in shiny objects and demonstrating a sales qualified lead wasn't that sexy. But it taught me many things about the need for commercial acumen and building the respect for the discipline that I held so close to my heart. So preparing for this presentation, um, some of you completed a survey. I couldn't do a, um, a talk on data science without some kind of empirical evidence. So thank you for you uh, that actually completed the survey. I was interested, how, how respected do you feel? 66% of you feel respected or somewhat respected. That's great. Yay, us. This is good. There's a couple of you who don't feel respected at all. Come and talk to me afterwards. Um, but I was really happy when I saw this. I thought, this is fantastic. We're really getting the respect that we deserve. All the blood, sweat, and tears that were being recognized for it. But I continued my research with a slightly wider base, and I came across this piece of research. Ouch. <laughs> oh, I want hurts in the stomach again. Body blow. 80% of CEOs don't trust marketeers at all. That was painful. And then I was like, hang on a minute, this is, so you're feeling respected, but we're not trusted. What, what's going on here? So I talked to my colleague at LinkedIn. I was like, what, what's going on here? And she came up with this amazing quote. She said, compliments are cheap, Katrina. <laughs> I was like, OK, so we dug a little deeper into the survey that you very kindly filled out for me. Now, I thought this was really telling. Now, looking at the data points here, 64% of you are getting budgets based on tactical measures. And thank you for your candor for the people, the 23% who said, you have no idea at all how you get your budget. You just spend what you're given. But equally, you know, what's left over, plus or minus 10% last year, you know, we're picking up the scraps. And then others, putting our hands out. I want to do this, I want to do some VR, can I have this? And there's very few of you, actually. I and mean, there's, there's about 20% of us that are actually looking at a percentage of revenue models. So we're, we're on that journey. 
But again, going back to this damning report, I took a quote from Jerome for us. It's like, what's causing this? And Jerome really sums it up here. Is that a fundamental job is to generate demand. And maybe sometimes we lose sight of that. But not just generate demand, but P&L, profit and loss responsibility. And it's this whole thing about changing us from a cost center that needs to be contained and cut and reduced to becoming an asset for the company that's fundamental to the growth of that organization. They just keep coming, these body blows. So 65% of the CEOs think we live in la-la land because we use phrases like ROI. There's an actually accounting specific on how you calculate ROI, and I'll talk about that tomorrow in my next session. But again, these are quite damning. So again, I asked you, are you able, this, this audience right here, are you able to demonstrate quantifiable, measurable demand for the products and services your company sells? And 20% of you feel that you can. You can definitely come and talk to me afterwards, please. And sometimes 45% of you can. So I think we're still on a journey. But when I actually asked you, you trained and return on marketing investment, 60% of you said no. So I think that's an opportunity for us to invest in ourselves. You're invested in yourselves in the next two days, but there's some financial, commercial investment that we need to take as a community. And I want to sum it up with this. It's a simple question. Was our marketing campaign profitable or not? How many of you could answer this question? How many of you sat in that chair? I've sat in that chair. It could be damn uncomfortable. Can you say, I know? It was successful. I think it was successful. I'm just going to leave that just to settle in your stomach for a little while. Okay. So if we're all agreed that there's an opportunity here, I'm now going to go into talking about data scientists and how they can help us with this situation. Breaking it down into three categories, plan, create, and measure. Before I go into that, though, I felt I needed to at least highlight who are these strange creatures, these data scientists? And it's kind of a new term. Some people say, oh, it's a data analyst that works in the Bay Area. Very sarcastic comments. But data science is not a new thing. It's a new term, but it's deeply seated in mathematics, in statistical modeling. And sure, there's a whole bunch of data they can play with now. It's like a kid in a candy store. My watch is tracking how many steps I take right now. Every movement that we're taking, every action is recorded. But these vast seas of data give these data scientists the opportunities to, to statistically validate and find connections that may not be obvious to the human eye. So, we're going to be sitting in rooms with these guys. I wanted to give you a Cliff Notes guide. At least you can bluff your way through your first um, meeting with them. So there's descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. You ready for this? So, if we think of descriptive analytics, it's really looking over our shoulder. What just happened? There are tools such as Google Analytics, Radian 6, you know, click-through rates, conversion rates. What happened? Did we, did, we do, did we do good? And I'm really happy to say that over 60% of you are using descriptive analytics today. So big thumbs up. Good job, I think you say. But equally, we're looking at predictive analytics, which is where it gets really interesting. Now, predictive analytics, if you think of that as a satellite navigation system, it dynamically changes the time of arrival based on new information. But you are still in charge of taking 
the decisions that are required to make that phone call. You're going to be late for that lunch. But it's giving you data. It's helping you understand where you're going. And in a marketing sense, predictability is really important for investors, for SMBs, and publicly quoted organizations as well. Neil just recently wrote a blog on this, which I wanted to share with you as well, because I think he really nails it. Whether you're in SMB going into the ABC Shark Tank, they want predictability. And the CMOs of the next generation need to demonstrate predictability. And they're transforming from a cost center to a profit center. So no matter where you are in the supply chain, of the creation of content. It's fundamental, we all understand. This is our reason for being, 